have such dignitaries and such dignified people as the late Václav Havel, some other prominent politicians and academics who subscribe to this point of view and who signed the private duration. On the other side, uh, as we all know, the devil works in the detail. The devil is in the detail. And uh, the reason why I was quite skeptical about the private declaration from the very beginning was that um, I was afraid that, you know, for some illiberal political forces in Eastern and Central Europe, it would be a big temptation to use this document to whitewash or to rewrite part of the history by changing the narrative and by showing that the Holocaust and the, and the massacre of European Jews was partly or technically somehow related to the fight against communism. And, then, and, I, and I thought that, you know, to misuse this document or just to try to squeeze some illiberal and anti-Semitic element would jeopardize, would place in jeopardy the entire thing. Of course, I would never, uh, never allow myself to think about Vaslav Havel as the one who would have thought of such a possibility. Uh, the democratic credentials of Vaslav Havel, of course, are beyond any doubt and beyond any question. But at the same time, we know that it's very tempting to misuse political documentation, political <coughs> documents, trying to squeeze something which is profoundly liberal and which has some um, dangerous political consequences and implications. That was the reason. And just precisely because I knew some details in my country, in Lithuania, and because I knew that there was still a problem of coming to terms with very, very difficult problems concerning uh, uh, historical evidence on the role of some prominent Lithuanian intellectuals or politicians in uh, the wartime history. So I knew that the Prague Declaration would allow to water down, if not to wipe white to, to, to wash away a big part of very painful questions which have to be tackled and challenged. So, uh, would you expand on the what, what is your uh, expect, what are your expectations about the present situation and the future situation? Well, I have to say that, uh, needless to say, I'm not so naive as to think that you know we have something like you know uh, an all-embracing European liberal consensus concerning the things in the in the European part. Of it, we have lots of anti-Semites. We have lots of far-right people, for instance. Suffice it to say that we have people from Jobbik, from the fascist Hungarian party, who are sitting next to Le Pen, uh, Christina Morby, a toxic anti-Semite from Hungary, for instance. We have many people, or there is another quite, quite mean tendency in the European Parliament when it comes to uh, an attempt to justify some allies. Like, it's a public secret that uh, some Italian colleagues were trying to justify the discovery during the scandal. But when it came to Viktor Orban, again, the devil was in the detail. Precisely because Fidesz is an ally, and people of Fidesz are in the EPP, in the European People's Party, so they were trying to justify Orban, which was disgraceful, of course. And now we have a, an absolutely awful situation in Hungary, when anti-Semitism is becoming more and more uh, open and uh, outspoken in Hungary, after Martin Gyongushi list, so to say, of Jews who would be dangerous for Hungarian security, and I thought that that was an insult, a slap in the face of Europe, an insult to Europe. Then there was no response from Viktor Orban as a prime minister. And when I saw some colleagues in the EPP justify Viktor Orban or remain silent about that, I thought that that was a disgrace. So that's why it's uh, very hard work. You have to work very, very hard and not to expect very easy victories, even in the European Parliament. Uh, concerning the Prague Declaration, it's very difficult to, to, to interpret because for some people, um, some Central East European dissidents like Havel are saintly figures, and in their Holocaust against communism, they imagine the Prague Declaration as a leading document, which you know just um, you know a sort of you know blazes the trail you know to the new phase concerning this. But in fact, uh, nothing against it. I remember that the vast majority of liberals are left uh, across the spectrum, decent people who feel very strongly against totalitarianism, who are um, in sympathy with the suffering of these central European nations. But they could understand that again, the, the document which allows a niche, or which allows a possibility to water down some questions that haven't been tackled yet. So it's a danger. <coughs> so that's why I, I remain convinced that we have, to, uh, we have to, 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 to preserve the spirit of skepticism, healthy skepticism, and not to be afraid of raising this issue. I realize that, you know, to paint in black and white is the last thing we should do. Because 
to imply that once you're against the Prague Declaration, you're justifying Stalinism, it's silly, of course. That's absolutely stupid. But we have to tell this in a very open and overt manner, that if Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Hungary, Slovakia, if any Central East European country would be crystal clear concerning the legacy of the Holocaust, if the political elites would be consensuous and decent enough to come to terms with the legacy, and to bring war criminals to justice, the Brock Declaration wouldn't be as scandalous as it was. Mm -hmm. So that was the reason, if we were acting in a very decent fashion, if all war criminals would have been brought to justice, for instance, if we had been absolutely outspoken, concerning some disgraceful facts of our history, I believe that the Brock Declaration wouldn't have become so controversial. But it became so precisely because of the reluctance of many political classes all over Europe to acknowledge and to come to terms with this. So that's why I believe this still comes as uh, something that polarizes the public opinion. It's a polarizing factor. But at the same time, of course, I realized quite well that uh, people who signed the Prague Declaration came or came up with different agendas. Hmm. I realized that there was nothing like, you know, a common denominator. They were different. And I realized it would be stupid to compare some people who could be uh, crypto Semites with people like Harold himself, or Vladimir Tishmoriano, for instance, a Romanian scholar, who spoke openly against the Holocaust, and who wrote many books about it, but at the same time who signed the Prague Declaration. So I think that we have to study the details very carefully. People are different, they signed this document. I allow myself to remain critical to it, but it doesn't mean that I classify them all as Semites. Let me let me add a uh, let me very, add a very important question about uh, how you convey back what you are doing in, in Brussels or Strasbourg, uh, which is obviously re very closely related to to an interpretation of uh, Lithuanian history back to Lithuania. So how is the, the, your work in the European Parliament uh, enabling you or uh, allowing you to, to work uh, on, uh, let's call it, civil society in Lithuania? Probably I will disappoint you, but uh, the fact is that nothing has changed overnight, so to say. When I became an MEP, nothing has changed in my life and work, so I was quite vocal on those things. I remain so. I rely on my friends and colleagues, uh, decent Lithuanian intellectual historians, and uh, I'm really delighted that people, uh, such people as Soros, Zizhevi, Rishonas, Biagis, and others are uh, present here. So, and of course, I rely on my French and my colleagues. And at the same time, I'm quite delighted to say that, well, among Lithuanian politicians, I saw some new faces, some new people who became allies or at least decent partners of the debate. So, at this point, I'm not uh, pessimistic, but I have to say that, well, um, when I became an MVP, I realized that on the one side, I have to represent Lithuania, I have to represent my country, and uh, it's a double responsibility. I have my responsibility as a Lithuanian, and I have my responsibility as a European, and as an MVP. So that's why I think that Lithuania is inseparable from Europe. And, well, it's quite logical that uh, you try you try sometimes to allow a wider context for the Lithuanian debate. At the same time, you come back to Lithuania with a wider context and you try just to expand mm. the horizon of my country. So, which is quite logical. But I believe that uh, nothing has changed. And uh, if you mean that uh, I have my immunity as, a, as an MVP, I didn't need that to become mm. vocal on these issues. I was so uh, many years ago. So uh, this is precisely because I feel and I find myself responsible for this in a double fashion. I'm a son of a Holocaust survivor, that's one. I'm a Lithuanian, that's number two. I'm a European, that's number three. And finally, I'm a Lithuanian academic. And I'm responsible for the young people of my country. So that's why I will be vocal, no matter in what shoes I'm going to stand.